Welcome to the Thyroid Fixer Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amy, and we're diving deep into the world of hormones, especially for all you fierce women in perimenopause and menopause, and everyone struggling with hypothyroidism. So if you are battling weight gain, you're feeling like shedding those pounds is an impossible feat. If you're dealing with plummeting energy levels, gut wrenching fatigue, or a libido that seems to have left town, then you're in the right place. And let's not even start on the hair loss. If these symptoms are sounding all too familiar, you have found your tribe. My goal is to educate, empower, and shake up your world. Remember, I want you to embrace every inch of that badass woman that you truly are. So if you're ready to dive in and fix things, let's go. So this is going to be a game changer for you, and you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in Metabolism Fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form, so you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. Doing Q&A podcasts is one of my favorite, favorite topics to do because the questions are coming from you. So I'm literally addressing exactly what you want to hear and what you want to know. And it lets us dump a lot of information in a short little podcast so that you can absorb it, listen. Maybe that person's questions is your question as well. So I hope this helps you. We're just going to get down and dirty with it. And just to let you know, I am going to put a free download for you in the show notes. So make sure you scroll down and click that because we're going to be talking a lot about labs. And it's important for you to have the list of labs to get. You've heard me talk about them ad nauseum on this show, but have that right in front of you. Get the labs get all of your labs, know which ones to get, because I've seen many of you, even in the Better Thyroid and Hormone Club, all y'all want lab readings, but you don't have all the labs. You have to have them all. If reverse T3 is missing, we can't do anything about that. We can't help you because we need that number. So download the free download, list of all the labs, and then I'm giving you the optimal lab ranges. So you don't have to post and say, wait, what's what's the what's the optimal range for free T3? It is right there, right there with you in front of you. So you can get all the labs and then compare it 
with a list. And this is going to help up level your health tremendously because when you know the answers to what's going on with you in your body, you're going to be a better patient advocate. You're going to be able to talk to your doctor in a very intelligent way. And you know the rule. If your doctor says no to testing, it's time to get a new doc. And hey, if you know more than your doc and you're having that intelligent conversation about what you need for your body and your doc won't listen, time to get a new doc. Okay, let's dive into some of these questions. Number one, how to dose T3. Now, ironically, I'm actually giving a presentation to a group of BHRT professionals. And we're talking about the variety of different doses of T3. Really how there's no one size fits all for T3 or for any kind of thyroid treatment as far as that goes. Treating the thyroid is nuanced. It is an art. It is individualized. It is personalized to you and your body. There is no one size fits all. So when you're asking, well, what's the average dose of T3? Or even if you ask another person, well, what dose of T3 are you on? It doesn't even matter what their answer is because what works for them might not work for you. So they might be on an itty bitty dose and they are rocking life on it. They might be on 10 micrograms twice a day. They're doing great. And you might ask another person or you yourself might need more T3. Maybe that wouldn't even be enough to get you through an hour of your day. You might need 50 micrograms twice a day. So there's no one size fits all whatsoever. But how you dose it. If you're just starting off on T3, it's always advised that you split dose T3. So now if you're out there and you're like, oh, I just can't remember in the afternoon to take my afternoon dose, then my answer to you, all you who say that, would be then you're going to stay exactly where you're at. Then obviously you don't want to change. Because if it's that hard to set an alarm and to carry some medication in your purse, then you really don't want to take the effort to do much of anything with your body. Trust me when I say that T3 is in and out of your system very quickly. So you have to split dose it. Now, some people will multi-dose it, meaning they might take it three or four times a day. And this is done either A, because you are dosing your T3, like Paul Robinson talks about in the circadian T3 method. And you are trying to match it up with cortisol patterns. Or you're just multi-dosing it because you don't tolerate a large dose at one time. So let's say Susie Q here can take 25 micrograms of T3 in the morning when she wakes up and another 25 at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Not a problem, goes on with her day, fine. And then you give it to Jane and Jane feels like she just drank 10 cups of coffee and is jittery and her heart's racing. Now, number one, that might just be too much T3 for her. She might be on too high of a dose. But she also might need to just split it up more. So maybe for Jane, doing 10, and then a couple hours later, 15, and then a couple hours later, another 15, and then a couple hours later, 10. And just breaking that T3 dose up a little bit, will be enough to allow her body to adjust to each dose and will allow her body to tolerate it where she won't get all jacked up and jittery. When we're talking about NP or armor, any kind of natural desiccated thyroid medication, same rule applies. So you want to split dose it or multi-dose it, whatever works for you. Usually split dosing is the easiest and I would say most people tolerate that very well. It's very rare that we have to multi-dose it through the day or use the circadian T3 method, but if we do, we do, that's fine. Just makes it a little bit more difficult to remember all of those different times to take T3, but we will certainly do it. NP thyroid, same thing. Anything with T3 in it, remember that it is in and out of your system. So if you're not split dosing it, not only are you missing out on the benefits of having T3 in your system in the afternoon, you're missing out on the metabolic effects too. So that boost in metabolism that you get in the afternoon is vital and it's relying upon T3 when you have hypothyroidism and your T3 is low. You need T3. If you don't give your body T3, your metabolism is going to drop. 
which is why you're gaining weight and you can't lose weight in the first place. That's why we want to dose that again in the afternoon. Very similar to dosing T2, although with T2, with thyroid fixer, we can dose it once in the morning and that has a carryover effect really through the whole day. I do have some people that like to split dose thyroid fixer as well because T2 will also provide a little bit more boost in the afternoon. Very, it's it's a steady energy though. It's not a stimulant. It's not a caffeinated energy. It's not even as as powerful of a punch of a stimulant as T3. It's much more gentle because it's working at the mitochondria and it's producing ATP. So that's a really nice kind of steady, rideable energy throughout the entire day. But some people will still multi-dose thyroid fixer as well. Take a dose in the morning and a dose in the afternoon. But usually one dose is fine. And we just leave it at that. T3, always, always split dose or multi-dosed. Okay, another question that we have here, how much do cruciferous vegetables down-regulate the thyroid? So you always hear about these goitrogenic foods. This would be your cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, notorious for interfering with thyroid medication absorption. And they are known as goitrogenic foods because they can actually produce a goiter. Now, here's the thing. If you cook them very, very well, we see that their goitrogenic properties go down. So just by cooking in olive oil, sauteing, stir frying, steaming, boiling, broiling, you're breaking down the, the fibrous structure of that cruciferous vegetable. And that in turn allows it to be more easily digested, number one. And it's also breaking down that goitrogenic property of it, for lack of a better word. So we find that those types of vegetables, in, when consumed in moderation, I mean, you're not a rabbit. You shouldn't be gnawing on raw vegetables all day long, nor should you be gnawing on just vegetables all day long. If you're on a plant-based diet, you're missing out on amino acids anyway, so that's a problem in and of itself. But if you're using these types of vegetables just because you really like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower, that's fine. Just cook them down. Really stir fry them. Really cook them down to break them down. And that way your body will better utilize it and it won't interfere with thyroid medication absorption. But with any thyroid med, you want to leave an hour on either side of consumption. No food, no coffee, no supplements. So it's not like you should be eating some stir fry broccoli and cabbage and then 20 minutes later take your thyroid medication like that's going to be a problem you want to leave that hour on either side anyways just best practice best practice okay medication changes what and how you might feel if changing from t4 to a combination of t4 and t3 how is that actually done? Well, here's, again, very nuanced art, right? So a patient comes in and they're on T4 only. We're always testing everything. So I'm looking at that reverse T3 and I'm saying, how are you converting that T4? Are you having issues converting T4 to T3? If that reverse T3 is high, that tells me that you need to lower your T4 medication and add in T3. Now, again, kind of going back to my first answer on T3, I also forgot to mention, if you're just starting out on T3, you want to start low and slow and gradually work your way up. So let's say your T3, I'm just giving case study scenarios right now. Let's say your T3 is coming in at a 2.3. Okay, we know that that's low. On any lab, that's going to be low. A 2.3. So we know, wow, we really need to build up this T3. And the reverse is below a 12. It's fine. Conversion is fine. But this poor person is on T4 monotherapy, which we know doesn't work. Again, T4 only doesn't work. I will repeat this stat till the day that I die. So anyone listening for the first time hears it. T4 only works in 2% of the population. 
with hypothyroidism. 98% need T4 and T3. Now, amongst that 2%, I would also argue, how do they look, feel, and perform? Are they just accepting that extra 30 pounds and dragging their ass through the day? Maybe that's their norm and they think that that's totally fine. But for the average person or for the badass person that would be listening to this podcast, that's not acceptable. So no, we do not accept being in a 2% if that requires us to be 30 pounds overweight and dragging our ass through the day. Talking again about the importance of getting in your protein, but it's hard to do. I get it. So I bring you a solution, Paleo Valley beef sticks. Now, when we're talking about beef sticks or jerky, there's so much out there on the market. And a lot of them will claim that their beef is grass fed just as long as it was fed grass at some point in its life. But really the cows are fed grains and they're just sprinkled in some grass fed marketed that way. And they can say that it's American made as long as it's packaged in America. You don't want that. Paleo Valley grass-fed beef sticks are the real deal. They are sourced from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished cows, never fed grains or harmful antibiotics. And they come from small family-owned farms right here in the USA. And they're good. So you want to grab some of these, add them in throughout the day, a fantastic snack on the go. Go to paleovalley.com backslash thyroid, and that's going to save you 15% off. So P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com slash thyroid, T-H-Y-R-O-I-D, and save 15%. T4 only doesn't work. So this person comes in on T4 only. Reverse T3 is below a 12. It's fine. Conversion is happening. Let's say they're on 88 micrograms of T4. Leave them on that because they're at least converting, but my God, they need T3. So now we start adding in T3 and you always want to start like five micrograms twice a day and gradually work your way up. Now, when I'm working with patients, I, I coach them on that. What to listen for in their body, what to look for, how to titrate up, maybe back down, whether they're going fast in their titration or they have to slow down. And then there's all those other factors that come into play when we're talking about tolerance of T3. If you are intolerant of T3, meaning the tiniest little amount makes you jittery and anxious and feels like you're crawling out of your skin, then we we baby step it. So maybe we start with 2.5 micrograms of T3 once a day. Then we move it to twice a day. Sometimes those people who are super sensitive, we might have to do a slow release T3, even though I'm not a fan of compounded T3. We might have to do a compounded or a slow release T3 so that they're getting a smaller dose throughout the day. So five micrograms of compounded slow release T3 will just spurt out maybe 0.5 to one microgram throughout the day as it's released, as it's time released. Now, when you're making the transition, sorry, I diverted there. When you're making the transition from T4 to a combination of T4 and T3, Again, I would still start very slow, low and slow. So in the first scenario, reverse is below a 12, T3 is a 2.3. Keep them on the 88 micrograms of Synthroid. Start adding in Lyothyronine, T3 very, very slowly at 5 and 5, 10 and 10, and build that up and test and retest. Ask yourself, how do you feel? And go from there. What if you're changing from T4 to an Armour Thyroid or an NP Thyroid? Well, again, we have to look at that reverse T3. We don't want to take someone from T4 only over to NP thyroid if the reverse is high because then we're just giving a whole lot of T4 again. Now, what we can do is drop the amount of T4. So let's say someone comes in 88 micrograms of Synthroid. We want to change them over to Armour, but maybe Armour and a little bit of T3 so we can change the ratio. So we start them on... 60 milligrams of armor, which naturally will drop the T4 amount that will help that reverse to come down. It will give that person a little bit of T3 that they weren't getting before. And then we can add in some lyothyronine to the armor. Now, as I'm saying all of these different scenarios, are you starting to see how nuanced it is, how personalized thyroid treatment is? And this is why it drives me bananas 
when these so-called functional, and I'm seeing more and more of this, I don't know why, but I'm seeing more and more functional, integrative, whatever other term they like to use, naturopathic, blah, 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 practitioners that all y'all have paid thousands of dollars to, and they don't know squat about the thyroid. They only use NP or armor. God forbid they actually touch T3. Well, to me, might as well go back into conventional medicine because you're not thinking outside the box and you're not treating that individual as an individual. Are you even asking them, how do they feel? No? Okay, well then quit charging people and go take insurance and go back to conventional medicine. Stop using the term functional. I have a whole podcast on that called Stop Using the Term Functional. It's basically my soapbox rant of all of these functional practitioners who promise you the world, yep, we're going to fix your thyroid, and they literally do one treatment only. Oh, and they won't go above 20 micrograms of T3 because supposedly it'll cause a heart attack. So to me, that tells me that they haven't thought outside of their medical textbook in years, and they need to go back to conventional medicine. Anyways. When we are figuring out what you need, we have to first ask you how you feel. Second, look at your labs. And third, when we actually start a treatment, we have to ask how you feel again. Because how you feel on the treatment determines how fast or slow we have to go. It determines what direction we go with that T3 medication, with the NP, with the NDT, all of it. You're looking at the whole picture of a person and you can see how important it is to look at an individual as a whole and take into consideration everything. We can't we can't use a, a cookie cutter approach here when it comes to thyroid treatment or hormone treatment for that matter. When you're doing that transition from T4 only to T4 and T3, you're going to feel good, but you have to remember too that it's not a linear progress. So you might start on T4 and T3, and you feel, oh my gosh, it's so much better than T4 only because it is. And you might feel like a rock star for a little bit. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, man, all those thyroid symptoms are coming back. The hypo symptoms are coming back. What do I do? Well, that's when we need to retest and adjust. Maybe your reverse went up again and we didn't drop enough in the T4. Maybe you just need a little bit more T3 and that'll do. Maybe. You are T3 only. So this brings me to another question. How do I know if I am T3 only? I love how one question just piggybacks into the next. How you know if you're T3 only is twofold. Number one, we could have you on the smallest amount of T4 and your reverse is still high. Well, that tells me, listen, you just do not convert well. It's blatantly obvious right there on paper. No matter how much T3 we put you on, no matter how low we go in the T4, say we're down to 30 milligrams of armor, we're down to 25 micrograms of Synthroid. Maybe we even cut the Synthroid in half. We use 12.5 and oh my God, your reverse T3 is still coming back at a 15, 18. No, you don't convert well. Will we still step back and look at all the issues of conversion? Sure, absolutely. What drives up reverse T3? Insulin resistance, estrogen dominance, low magnesium, low iodine, genetic factors, genetic SNPs that you just don't convert, leaky gut, liver issues, inflammation. The list goes on and on and on. So yeah, we're going to address all of that, what's driving up your reverse T3. But we also might have to step back and say, "Mm, you're a T3 only candidate. The other way we know that you're T3 only is by trial and error. So we see that something is going on here. Your free T3 looks good. Your reverse is not elevated. It's below a 12. We have 25 micrograms of Synthroid in, and you still are experiencing all of these hypo symptoms. Okay, so what do we do? Let's pull the T4 just for a little bit, a couple of weeks. How do you feel? Oh, I feel better. Okay. Now let's put that T4 back in. Just do it for a week or two. How do you feel? Oh my gosh, I feel so bad. Like I'm bloated again. Put on a couple pounds. My mood is really low. I can't think. All right, pull it out again. 
Oh, yeah, that's way better. Okay. Pound started to shed. Brain fog lifted. I right, put it back in. Ah, no, it's horrible. And do that a couple times, and that way you know through trial and error that you are T3 only when T4 makes you worse. And you have to do this a couple of times. You can't just do it once and say, okay, that's it. Because we ultimately want to have a savings account. I always talk about having T4 in the mix as being your savings account. And being T3 only is like living off your checking. Everybody wants to have a little bit in savings so you can draw from it in times of need. So if you are T3 only, you are living off your checking. And that's not great. But if it's needed to be done, it's needed to be done. If you need it, you need it. I live off my checking, i.e. I am T3 only. So that's kind of how you do that transition. But it's really important to be able to just bounce off how you feel with somebody that knows what they're doing, especially when you're doing that transition. While there is no danger per se, like there's no danger in having a suppressed TSH. If your doctor freaks out over your suppressed TSH, that's another big sign to run, run, run from your doctor. But that being said, we don't want you over medicated because that's where you will feel icky and sticky. You won't feel well. You'll be anxious. You'll be jittery. You just won't feel right. We don't want you in that anxious state. I don't want your heart rate to be 130 when you're sitting down working at your computer. That's a problem. So if we get those kinds of reactions, then obviously we need to back down. And that's where it's important to be working with someone and not doing it yourself. Although I fully trust you to listen to your body, I just recommend working with somebody so that you do it correctly. That's all. And finally, the last question of the day, water weight. How do you determine whether it's fat or water? What if the scale goes up? We talked about the progress not being linear, that you might need changes along your optimization journey. And there's going to be med changes and dose changes and tweaks here and there and further testing. But what if you start gaining weight? You need to check to see if it's water weight or not. Now, we've talked a lot lately about tracking your food, the importance of knowing what goes into your mouth, carbohydrates, macronutrients, amount of calories, amount of protein. We want to know how much water you're drinking as well. All the tracking in the world is very, very beneficial. But let's say you are retaining water or the scale has just gone up. Let's leave it at that. The scale went up and you're like, am I gaining fat or am I holding water? What's going on? What I want you to do is a water challenge. Now, this is going to do a couple different things for you that we'll talk about. First of all, you're going to go out, and this is from my OG bodybuilding days. This is how we got ready for a show. This is how we dropped water weight so that we had no subcutaneous water blurring the striations and the muscle definition. You know, we want them six-pack abs to be popping. So we went out. This is what I did. Went out and got multiple gallons of distilled water. Now, yes, we still took electrolytes. So don't ask me what the distilled does. It's just kind of magical. And you don't want to do this for too long because you need the electrolytes in the water. Although you could take electrolytes separately. Gallons of distilled water. And all you're doing is drinking from that gallon all day long. So you need to fill up your water bottle, fill it up from that gallon of distilled water. And you want to get in that gallon every single day, maybe even two. I mean, if you really talk to the pros, they're saying a gallon, they're laughing at you. They're like, I do two gallons a day. What are you talking about? But for all y'all who are drinking like, you know, 30 ounces right now, a, a gallon will be a good place to start. And there's something that happens. Number one, you're giving your body more water than what you're normally used to which when we drink more, we retain less. If you do not drink enough water, not only will you not burn fat, you will also retain water like a camel. So I don't want to hear about it, about you retaining water if you're only drinking 20, 40, 60 ounces a day. It's not enough. The other thing that drinking from a gallon of water will do is show you how much water you're drinking. Because you might think that you drink enough until you drink from that gallon. And it is, I. it's just like writing your food down. It is eye-opening. I've done it. I've been shocked before. 
really thinking that, wait a minute, I fill up my water bottle all the time. Yeah, I fill it up when it's halfway down and it makes me think like I'm drinking four 20 ounce bottles, but I'm really not. So measure, look, see, did you only drink half of that gallon? Did you only drink a third of that gallon? Oh my God, then you need to step it up a notch. So that's going to be really helpful as well. Seeing how much water you actually take in. Water challenge. The distilled water will help you flush. And you're going to do that one gallon and really reach for it. If on day one, you don't finish the gallon, your goal that next day is that whole gallon. And then as you get to the end of the week, you can kind of fall back into a norm. I would like drinking a gallon a day to be a new norm for you. But let's say you pull back just a little bit. You're like, okay, I'm on day seven, coming to the end, lost some water weight. And then you naturally drink like a half a gallon to three quarters you'll see that water weight drop off. So that's what we did is then as we got closer to a show, we started reducing the amount of water that we took in. Now there's a variety of different ways to do this. Different coaches have, some coaches don't drop water at all. They just take it high all the way through the show. Some do, some don't, some use diuretics, whatever. But in general, if you drink a gallon a day and then you just pull back a little bit, your body is still flushing a gallon a day. So it's going to pull that subcutaneous water and flush it out then that way you'll be able to see, oh yeah, I was just holding water because I wasn't drinking enough water. I was holding water because I ate too many carbohydrates and carbohydrates retain water. I was holding water because I'm too high on my testosterone dose and that's causing me to retain water. I'm retaining water because it's fluctuating hormones. It's you ate sushi. I don't know, but it's going to let you see, oh yeah, this is water, not fat. If you do that water challenge and you're still the same weight, then you put on fat and you need to figure out why. Are you jacking your blood sugar up? Are you not sleeping well? Are you not lifting heavy? Are you not tracking? Do you think that you're taking an XYZ amount of macros, but you're not? Maybe you're under eating, maybe you're overeating. Whatever it is, that's at least going to let you know. And that way you can go down a different path and figure out why are you gaining weight. But do that water challenge because that is so, again, it's so eye-opening. And we have to remember these, these simple hacks, these simple tweaks, these simple things that we can do that don't require any money. They don't require a device, but they absolutely 100% tell us what's going on in our body and what we need to change personally, especially with our behaviors and our choices. So once again, check the show notes for that download. I want you to see all of the labs that you need to get. And I want you to see your optimal lab values because that really is the starting point. And then you can dive down the rabbit hole of changing your meds, adding in T3, getting nuance, personalizing your thyroid treatment, looking at your diet, tracking your water, all of those things. All right. I hope this helps. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I hope you loved it. And as always, if you would be so kind to leave a review, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, that would be absolutely amazing. I read all of them. Also, anything that you hear on this podcast is not intended to diagnose or treat any kind of medical condition. So we always recommend that you check with your medical provider, your doctor, your nurse practitioner before implementing anything that you hear on this podcast. And if you want to find out more about working together, you can click the link below in the show notes to book a discovery call. And there you'll be talking to a member of my team. They are an extension of me. They are amazing. And you and I will talk after that once we get you all signed up and you and I get to work together. All right. I hope to see you soon.